Dennis, why don't we get started? Good afternoon, I'm Dennis Galecki, and welcome to the 416th Imagine Buffalo program and our 37th virtual Imagine lecture. This is hosted by the Buffalo and Erie County Public Library. Hey, thanks so much for joining us today. This program is created by the Center for the Study of Art and Architecture, History and Nature, or Cezanne as I like to call it, and ImagineLifelongLearning.com. Now we're going to start with our speakers shortly, but first a little housekeeping. Everyone watching will be muted during our speaker's presentation, which will last about 15 minutes or so. We'll have time for questions at the end. So if you do have a question, please type it into the chat box and we'll get to as many as we can. This program is being recorded. You'll be able to watch it again later on the library's Facebook and YouTube channels, and hopefully share the link with your friends and networks. As a reminder, Life Willing will be here on Zoom every Tuesday at 12.30 p.m. with a great lineup of local speakers. Now, this is the second Tuesday of the month, and our focus, therefore, is architecture and design. And it was the design part that uh, prompted me to schedule our two speakers today. Our theme is imagine a healthy, wealthy, and sustainable community. Imagine uh, lifelong learning. Today's featured speakers are Father William Weichsner and Reverend Tom Yorty, who are also scheduled to speak at the 12th annual Buffalo Day at Chautauqua on Friday, August 6th on today's topic, creating are building, rather, building a uh, culture of empathy from Franciscan spirituality to Schweitzer's reverence for life ethic. Father William Weichsner, known as Father Judd, is a Franciscan friar and Catholic priest and is pastor of Saints, Columbia, Bridget Church on Hickory Street in Buffalo. A native Buffalonian, he grew up in St. Benedict's Parish in Eggertsville. He attended Nickel School and the University of Notre Dame and went to UB for grad school before joining the Franciscans. He is a member of the Slow Roll Squad on Monday nights. And when he's not on his bike, you can find him kayaking on the Buffalo River. He has served locally, nationally, and internationally with Franciscan groups dedicated to promoting justice peace, and the care of God's creation. Reverend Thomas Yorty came to Westminster Presbyterian Church in 1998, following pastorates in uh, Easton, Pennsylvania, and Williamsville, New York. Tom grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, graduated from Muskingum College, Yale Divinity College, uh, School, and Drew University, PhD in 19th century studies and has served on the board of Auburn Theological Seminary in New York City since 2003. During Tom's pastorate at Westminster, the congregation has continued its historic role as a leader in mission to the city, social justice, and worship and music ministries. In 2005, the church launched the Westminster Economic Development Initiative, which provides business coaching and loans to Buffalo's growing immigrant community, as well as an English language learner after school program for K through eight children. So now let's welcome Father Judd and Reverend Tom Yorty. Okay, is my uh, screen sharing working? Yes. Dennis? Okay, great. Well, yes, thanks. Dennis. Dennis. Thanks, Dennis, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be on this with Tom. And I'd like to give a shout out to Sister Colleen. I see she's on. She helped give a, a retreat based on this with me over uh, the season of Lent, along with Paula, who should be joining us later as well. Uh, building a culture of empathy from Franciscan spirituality. Uh, let's start with the Franciscan spirituality part. Uh, Franciscan spirituality is based on St. Francis. On the left, that's an icon of Francis. And on the right are three current Franciscans. That's me in the middle with Brother Tim 
and Father Gabe, we live together at Saints Columba Bridget. Franciscan spirituality is based on St. Francis of Assisi. And then I'll also get a little bit into Pope Francis's document called Fratelli Tutti. Uh, starting off with St. Francis, uh, Francis uh, lived from 1182 to 1226, and he's generally considered the most popular saint of all time. And in terms of architecture and design, Francis had one of his most uh, moving experiences uh, in an old church outside the walls of Assisi that was crumbling, literally crumbling, uh, San Damiano. He heard a voice coming from the cross that said, Francis, rebuild my church. And he started doing it literally with bricks and mortar. And later on, he realized he was being called to do it spiritually. But that would be the connection to architecture and design here. That's how Francis got uh, some of his earliest inspiration. And he'd be scandalized that such a beautiful basilica was built in Assisi with his name. He wanted things to be humble and poor. And uh, the basilica there is just magnificent. One of the key moments in Francis's life was an encounter with a leper. When he grew up, he was repulsed by people with leprosy, but he had an encounter with the leper on the road, and he actually hugged the leper and kissed him, and that was a turning point in Francis's life to have concern for others, which leads us into the concept of empathy. One of the definitions that Dennis had sent out to me earlier for empathy is that it arises out of a willingness to care, to endeavor to understand, and to place oneself within the human experiences of others. And that's certainly something that St. Francis of Assisi did. But I think there's another concept even more accurate than empathy, and that would be solidarity. And this comes from a definition from the United States Catholic bishops. We are one human family, whatever our national, racial, ethnic, economic, and ideological differences. We are our brothers and sisters keepers wherever they may be. And that concept of solidarity was certainly promoted by um, Pope John Paul II. And there's a photo of him with Lech Walesa, who headed the Solidarity Union in Poland. And John Paul said that solidarity is not a feeling of vague compassion or shallow distress at the misfortunes of so many people, both near and far. On the contrary, it is a firm and persevering determination to commit oneself to the common good. That is to say, to the good of all and of each individual, because we are all really responsible for all. So you can see how solidarity kind of takes us one step beyond empathy. And St. Francis lived solidarity. On the bottom left, uh, he was brother to preach all creatures, including the wolf who was terrorizing a town of Gubbio. He was in solidarity with the um, his Muslim brother in Egypt at the bottom right. And he was uh, brother and sister to all of creation, as we can see from the depiction of brother son up above. So I mentioned Fratelli Tutti earlier. What is Fratelli Tutti? Well, it's not a tutti frutti ice cream, despite the name. Uh, Fratelli Tutti is an encyclical by Pope Francis. And what's an encyclical? An encyclical is not a cycling event. An encyclical is not a musical production by InSync. An encyclical is a letter sent out to the whole world. And Pope Francis did this in October of 2020 when he sent out Fratelli Tutti to the world. And Fratelli Tutti literally means all brothers. So does that mean that uh, the sisters are left out of this? Well, not really, because uh, it came from, comes from a quote that uh, St. Francis said, let us all brothers consider the good shepherd who to save his sheep for the suffering of the cross. And you can see in red there, the translation of all brothers is Fratelli Tutti. So it really does include, he was speaking to just guys, his fellow friars. So Fratelli Tutti really is accurately translated as brothers and sisters to all. And a brief look at the introduction to Fratelli Tutti, Francis says that God has created all human beings equal in rights, duties, and dignity and has called them to live together as brothers and sisters. So you'll see that theme throughout the encyclical. He also calls us to dream as a single human family, brothers and sisters to all. So in the introduction, he, he really sets the stage for what comes next. The first chapter 
he talks about some of the difficulties we're experiencing, dark clouds over a closed world. And we experienced that in Buffalo, certainly too, during the COVID pandemic. Uh, Francis says that we're witnessing the promoting of individual interests in the weakening communitarian dimensions of life. We've probably all experienced that. Francis, Pope Francis says that persons are no longer seen as a paramount value to be cared for and respected, especially when they are poor and disabled, not yet useful like the unborn or no longer needed like the elderly. And Francis says that we encounter the temptation to build a culture of walls, to raise walls, walls in the heart, walls on the land, in order to prevent encounter with other cultures, with other people. And Francis cautions us that isolation and withdrawal into our own interests are never the way to restore hope and bring about renewal. Rather, it's closeness. It's the culture of encounter. So Francis says that once this health crisis passes, our worst response would be to plunge even more deeply into feverish consumerism and new forms of egotistic self-preservation. God willing, after all this, we will think no longer in terms of them and those, but only us. And he concludes the chapter saying that despite these dark clouds, which may not be ignored, God continues to sow abundant seeds of goodness in our human family. I invite everyone to continue then to advance along the paths of hope. So here it gets into, we skip over chapter two, we just don't have enough time, but chapter three, envisaging and engendering an open world. Francis talks about concepts like social friendship at the local level and universal fraternity at the global level. He's spreading this idea of brothers and sisters beyond just our own backyard. And he contends that our social policies must be with the poor, not for or of the poor. In chapter four, which he entitles a heart open to the whole world. He talks about how the arrival of those who are different can be a gift for the communities and societies to which they come. And we've certainly seen that in Buffalo with our immigrant community. Chapter five talks about a better kind of politics. And Francis tells us that the poor must be valued in their dignity, respected in their identity and culture. And it may seem naive and utopian, but we should strive for an exchange of gifts for the common good. And this is a picture 30 years ago today, I left for a mission year in Peru. And this is a group that was put together to support me while I was there by helping me reflect on my experience. The pastor in Lima included people from the poorest suburb, which was built on a garbage dump in the richest suburb of, uh, richest part of Lima, Peru. And it was a great experience bringing the people together. As Pope Francis says, a torrent of moral energy springs from including the excluded in the building of a common destiny. So people from the shanty town who had been excluded, all of a sudden, instead of being shunned by the people from the rich part of town, were, were hugging, were, were being given rides home instead of taking the bus. It was a beautiful experience of crossing boundaries. So, the very first paragraph of Fratelli Tutti, they quote St. Francis, who calls for a love that transcends the barriers of geography and distance, and that allows us to acknowledge, appreciate, and love each person regardless of physical proximity, regardless of where he or she was born or lives. In the Diocese of Buffalo right now, re we are reorganizing in what we call families of parishes. And for now, the plan is that there'll be parishes that are geographically next to each other. But my hope is that based on that experience in Peru and based on what Pope Francis calls us to, that a parish like St. Columba Bridget, which is in a zip code that's in the bottom 3.3% of the country, might align, say, with a parish from East Amherst, Swarmville, St. Mary's, which is in the top 6% of the nation in terms of poverty level. Um, this road to renewal, that the diocese is embarking on, I hope could be an example for our whole region, which we know is divided by segregation, by income inequality, by many other issues. So I'm hoping that the Buffalo Diocese, by breaking down geographical boundaries, showing that we can all be brothers and sisters to each other, could be a great model, not just for the Catholic population, but for all of Western New York. 
So thanks very much, Tom. I'm looking forward to, to your, uh, your follow-up with uh, Albert Schweitzer. Thank you, Judd. Um, and Dennis, you, you and Melissa are the timekeepers. So keep us on, on track here. We want to certainly have time for Q&A. Um, you know, I'm, I'm impressed listening to that uh, talk about St. Francis, uh, Judd, of the profound resonance at a deep spiritual level of Albert Schweitzer and St. Francis. I think they are, you know, obviously kindred spirits. And, and if I had to bet, uh, I would bet uh, dimes to donuts that Albert Schweitzer had, had done some study and reading of St. Francis in his life. Uh, because Schweitzer's life uh, was, you know, embodied much of what you were just talking about. He was a polymath, which, uh, which I understand to be someone who's good at anything he decides to, you know, em embark upon. He was an Alsatian, Alsace-Lorraine, uh, 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 which at the time when he was born in about 1875, um, uh, a part of Germany. Uh, he, after the First World War, he, claimed, he reclaimed his uh, French citizenship. Alsace-Lorraine has gone back and forth between those two uh, countries. Um, but uh, I was happy to see that he was an Alsatian because that's where my uh, family roots are. He. Um, want to kind of quickly get to, uh, to two points today. On the way, let me simply say that he, he, was, he had a PhD in theology. Um, he did a study of the religious ethics of Immanuel Kant um, at the University of Strasbourg. It was published uh, at the University of uh, Tübingen. I mean, these, these were the, the premier universities of the day in, in Germany. Um, he had a doc, his medical degree, as we all know, went to serve a mission in uh, Gabon, what was a French colony um, somewhere in the center of, uh, of, of, of Africa, bounded on one side by the Congo, if that kind of gives you a, a Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, he, um, uh, he was a... a um, uh, he could have been a world-class uh, organist. He studied with uh, Charles Maria Vidor. He uh, transformed Vidor's understanding of Bach uh, by his own understanding of Bach's music. And um, uh, he, was, he had a huge impact on organ building. Talk about design. He, his influence on organ building essentially reigned until about the early 1980s, right through the 20th century. Um, let me talk about two things, his reverence for life and his, the quest for the historical Jesus. First of all, uh, the, um, the quest for the historical Jesus. That was a book he published, uh, his uh, discovery after his attempt to find who was Jesus and the actual words of Jesus that we could document and verify was that we will never find the historical Jesus, uh, that there is no person Jesus that we can find in history. There was a, uh, certainly Jesus was historical. He wasn't denying that, but he, um, he said that this pursuit of Jesus through the history books uh, is if we're going to find this spiritual leader uh, actually leads to futility. Uh, the flip side was he said, if we simply go with traditional Christology to the supernatural Jesus, uh, we won't find him there either, um, but that Schweitzer was a mystic, and, and he said that we find Jesus in our application of uh, being in Christ, what he called in Christ, in our day-to-day -day living, in our own struggle to be Christian uh, in our day-to-day -day living. His reverence for life um, was founded on uh, the will to live, the struggle to live by all living creatures. And it was, res it was giving respect and dignity for all creatures to live, to realize their potential to live, that his reverence for life is founded. And I would add one thing, that it was, that it was John Keats, the great English poet, uh, who really discovered the pathway to empathy when he talked about discovering the pain of others in our own pain. So it's, 
it's recognizing, it's giving dignity and respect to the, to the potential of every living creature, but it's also realizing that we as human beings do suffer. And if human life is about suffering, all people suffer. And that's where we connect with others um, through, th through suffering and uh, therefore empathy and compassion and reaching out to others. Um, Keats offered that insight before the existentialists, Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, before Emerson in the 1820s, he was writing poetry and his letters depict that, uh, that empathy that, that Dennis lifted up. And I thought it was important to add that today because we need empathy in today's world more than ever in this polarized society we're living in. Dennis. Wow. Uh, as you, you pulled it off, I, I, I don't know. As how you're you, muted, I think. You squeezed up, a, whoops. Let's see if, um, no, I don't show myself muted. Can you hear me? Can't hear you, Dennis. I'm sorry. Dennis, uh, I, Dennis I can hear you. Well, that's a problem. All right. <laughs> uh, good. Um, because I, I show myself not muted. So let's let's um, let's try it. Uh, th this again will be a presentation um, at Chautauqua. Their whole week six theme uh, is called building a culture of empathy. Uh, so I thought, and and this presentation will be part of the Department of Religions program for Friday, August 6th. So uh, those interested in Chautauqua uh, events, uh, please keep that in mind. And our two speakers will have a little more time to develop uh, both thoughts. But uh, really, uh, thank you for mentioning that empathy I, is needed today. If you can't hear me, I don't know how we're going to play off. Can you hear? Um, I, can, I can hear you, Dennis. Oh, OK, good. Tom, then it's only yourself. I'm sorry that uh, if you can't hear me. Um, so uh, why don't uh, Judd, why don't we uh, ask our attendees to give any questions? And while we're doing that, uh, just just uh, the world is talking a lot about sustainability. That's going to be a, uh, a series of 10 lectures we're going to do in the Imagine series all summer. And this is really, in my mind, a prelude to that. Sustainability, I believe, is uh, the foundation of that could be considered empathy, that, that uh, to be a sustainable community is to literally look around, appreciate our surroundings, appreciate our neighbors, uh, our, our uh, water, air, uh, what we all need, uh, what individually we need collectively. So I think this will serve as a uh, cornerstone, uh, much like the churches that both of you uh, physically uh, had uh, worship services in as a cornerstone. So too do I hope today's program, then connecting with Chautauqua, then connecting with the summer series of 10 weeks uh, will do for sustainability as well as empathy. Does that ring true, uh, uh, those that can hear? Uh, Father Judd or, uh, yeah, or Tom? I think very much does. So Tom, are you, are you able to hear me, Tom? Yeah, sorry, uh, oh. my fault. Got loud and clear. Thanks, Judd. Oh. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, the first thing I just wanted to mention though, Tom, is I think you might be more true to the Franciscan spirit than I am because St. Francis wrote to us that preachers should be brief. So you did a much better job of that than I did today. So kudos to you for that Franciscan charism that you <laughs> demonstrated. Uh, Dennis, I think that sustainability is a form of empathy or solidarity, but projected into the future. You know, it's saying that we are brothers and sisters, not just to our generation, but to future generations. And certainly the First Nations, the indigenous peoples, uh, many of them had the tradition that we make our decisions based on what will happen to the seventh generation from now. And I think that's another way of, of saying sustainability and tying it into solidarity. Good point. Tom, could you hear my uh, uh, observation and then reflect on it or not? Well, I heard, I heard the, the tail end of it, but I would, I would say to Judd, you remember that famous saying that, uh, uh, that preachers should preach and when necessary use words. <laughs> um, 
I, you know, Dennis, um, I, you know, it, I think, you know, the issue of empathy is, uh, could not be more timely. Uh, pundits are now questioning uh, whether this doom loop that we are in with the uh, prevalence of um, and, and the credibility uh, for many people of conspiracy theories uh, that threaten to disrupt democracy in this country. Um, and that goes, you know, the necessary and required animosity and polarization that goes along with those conspiracy theories. Um, uh, I, I think, and, and what I take to be good advice is that where I have family members on the other side of the fence for me in terms of some of these theories and understandings of what's going on in the nation right now is not to get into political arguments, but to connect with each other at a human level. How, you know, how's you, how are the kids? You know, how's, how's your oldest daughter doing? You know, they're just um, responding to a crisis that they had. Um, uh, what are your plans this summer for vacation? I mean, trying to connect at those human levels will bring us back together, I think, in, in, in some kind of relationship where we do have empathy for one another. And Dennis, I think, you know, you, you've got a pulse on, on what we need to do today, which is um, exercise some, some empathy and not, and put aside all the political, I think, not all the political and, and not that I'm unwilling to go there and mix religion and politics, so important. But I think where we are at odds with others on those issues, we need to have empathy. Dennis, this reminds me of that talk at Chautauqua a few years ago where you invited me to talk about the slow roll. I thought that the, uh, the slow roll bike ride in Buffalo, I imagine many of you are familiar with it. Hopefully you haven't been stuck in traffic for too long because of it. And our rides are smaller this year. I thought that the beauty of the slow roll was that it brought together people from suburb and city, from different neighborhoods, different economic classes, different races, different religious backgrounds, you name it. And we rode together as one unit, as one body. At times, it was almost like a mystical body riding through the streets of Buffalo. And the friendships and the acquaintances that arose through that, I thought, were a beautiful thing that really set the stage for more progress in bringing people together in Western New York. You know, so you didn't have to be making political statements along the slow roll. The slow roll itself was a form of a political statement saying, you know, we're doing something together, not just spectators like you would be at a, at a Bills game, but actually doing something together in forming bonds. And I think we need more and more examples of things like that in Western New York and throughout the world. Both good examples, uh, fellows. Melissa, uh, we're, we may go over a minute or two, but uh, let's try to get some questions, as many as possible. Do you have any? Yes, we have two questions right now. Um, so the first is, the Schweitzers are smart. Did Albert ever speak in Buffalo or Chautauqua? No, uh, he, not to my knowledge, he did not. Um, he did win the Nobel Peace Prize. He lived into the 1960s, but I, I, I don't, I wouldn't be surprised if he found his way to Chautauqua actually, you know, given its, uh, program and and religious uh, roots uh, of, of its mission, but not that I know of. Well, that's, that's something we can ask the archivist down there to double yeah. check for us. Absolutely. And uh, another question, isn't there a basic conflict between empathy and greed, which is the foundation of capitalism? Well, I would say uh, there is a basic conflict between empathy and greed, or that you need to let go of your, one needs to let go of one's greed to have empathy. But I wouldn't say, I would not necessarily connect a dot directly, therefore, to capitalism, um, to, to say that capitalism equals greed. I don't, I don't think that's necessarily true at all. I think there are, it can, it, you know, there can be people who are greedy to acquire and consume and, and, uh, and have it all, but, but we've seen incredible examples, and Schweitzer was one, 
of philanthropic generosity because of one's own blessings in a free and open economy. Uh, Pope, Pope Francis, as long as other church leaders have cautioned against using the market as the sole determinant of you know, what's best for society, but he's also more recently cautioned us against looking to technology for all the answers. And he's really emphasizing this need for a humanistic look at things to not take human beings out of the equation and rely solely on economic forces or on, on technology. And yeah. greed, I think uh, the way that greed plays into that is that if you just strictly go by the market and who the market benefits, um, that would seem to favor those who have that impulse toward, toward greed. Um, um... You know, you look at people like Andrew Carnegie or Bill Gates in the news of late, but the, uh, the way in which they're using uh, Warren Buffett, um, you know, living in a, a wonderful examples of people who have, you know, John, John uh, uh, the founder of the Vanguard funds, uh, Dennis, um, uh, yeah, who said, who said, I have something most Americans don't have. I have enough and lived in a very middle class uh, home and uh, lifestyle. So, um, no, I would say that there does need to be balance and, 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 and regulation in a capitalist society as large and prosperous as ours, that we do need to make sure that those who have less uh, are not taken advantage of and abused uh, and that they're, and the disproportionate CEO salaries that we see with the world worker on the line is not a good situation. So, but uh, it's, it seems to me it's a constant sort of uh, tinkering with our, uh, with our economy, which is incredibly complex thing to do. Um, but we need to constantly strive so that no one uh, suffers because of want and poverty. Let me chime in on that as well, on, the, on, on that uh, offering up weekly classes I have over the years at Chautauqua on called The Art of Investing. One of the questions I always find uh, I'll ask the, the class, is it greedy? Is it greedy to want 2% instead of 1%? Uh, statistically, it's a 100% increase you want. Uh, but uh, uh, greed, sometimes uh, uh, capitalism is, a, is, until we find a better system, it's sure the best the world has. And it does, it may uh, inspire greed, be greedy behavior by some, but I wouldn't say all capitalism uh, is rooted in greed. It's, it's rooted in wanting to invest and, uh, and reap the rewards from that investment uh, in making the world a better place than we found it. You, you know, Dennis, I, I, um, I'm just one more comment on that because it, it's so easy to fall into this simplistic black and white interpretation of, you know, the economy or of, of, of greed and philanthropy. But I am so impressed with the people I know uh, who have a philanthropic, um, you know, responsibility, who struggle, uh, who, who, because they are approached by so many groups and uh, people to share their wealth, uh, the, the, the degree to which, th th that is for them a spiritual struggle, I believe. And uh, more than once I've heard people say, I wanted to give not to satisfy the person that asked me and make them happy. I wanted to give to stretch myself and uh, in my giving and not just be comfortable. Um, so it's, it's complicated. But, you know, we have that issue in this country. How do we deal with wealth? And that's why this uh, overarching theme is imagine place-based lifelong learning. Uh, uh, if we think we have the answer, we might want to uh, rethink and, uh, and at least be open to uh, the learning aspect. I think that's what's going on. It's what gives me hope uh, that, that uh, places like Chautauqua exist to explore uh, topics that we may not have on our agenda, like building a culture of empathy uh, and then getting speakers uh, literally from around the country and world uh, to at least uh, open our minds and give us fresh uh, food for the soul as well as uh, 
as the mind. Uh, anything else, Melissa, before we wrap up? Those, those were all the questions. That, that's good. Guys, uh, you, you've uh, far exceeded my, my expectations. This was gonna be a tough one to squeeze into a half hour, but you did it magnificently. And, and my thanks to you. Uh, we, will, uh, we will reconvene next week, uh, uh, life willing, and uh, we will come back. You know, I, I, uh, this was a bit of an experiment. Uh, it's one thing to look at uh, art, architecture, history, and nature, but uh, I wanted to look at that design element. How do you design a culture? A culture, in this case today, of empathy. Uh, during the summer, we'll look at a culture of sustainability. I think those are architectural questions uh, as, uh, uh, that are worthy of uh, the Imagine program, Imagine Greater Buffalo. So next week, uh, same time, same Zoom link, uh, when we talk with Jim Charlier uh, about Garden Walk Buffalo. They should resume after uh, a bit of a hiatus last year. Uh, and uh, it'll be lovely images that we'll see of Buffalo at its finest. Uh, that last weekend in July is uh, traditionally our garden walk Buffalo. So come on by next week and, and uh, be part of that uh, presentation as well. I'm Dennis Galucky. Have a good afternoon and be well. Mm-hmm.